Swinburne University of Technology. Hi, I'm Glenda Francis and this is the first part of the Week 2 Lecture. So this week we'll be doing a, a quick review of some of the concepts from last week. We'll be looking at descriptive statistics, how to choose the correct analysis and the normal distribution. So let's start with a quick recap of last week's work. To begin with last week we looked at the definition of a population and a population is all of the things that you're interested in. So that might be people or tires or trips to work. Usually we can't collect information from the entire population so we take a sample and we use the sample to make inferences about the population. If you're conducting a study yourself or if you're reading the results from someone else's study you need to watch out for bias both in the way the sample was selected and in the questions that were asked or the measurements which were made. If there's no bias then the sample will allow us to draw conclusions about the population that we're interested in and we call that inference. We're inferring something about the population based on the sample. But if the, se if the sample selection was biased or if the measurements were biased then the sample won't tell us anything about the population that we're interested in. Now let's look at one more definition. A variable. A variable is anything that we want to measure that varies. So for example if we surveyed a sample of Australian adults we might collect information about things like their age or their sex or their marital status, the amount of time they spent watching TV. All of these things vary from one person to another. When you're thinking about whether something's a variable or not you should think about it in terms of a question. So age is a variable because you can ask someone what is your age and the question makes sense. Different people will give different answers so age is a variable. What about male? Is male a variable? Can you ask someone what, what's your male? No, that doesn't make any sense at all. So male isn't a variable. The variable here would be sex. You can ask someone what's your sex and the answers will vary. People will either say male or female. How about the amount of time you spent watching TV? Is this a variable? You could ask someone to tell you about the amount of time they spend watching TV. This question makes sense. Different people will give you different responses. So yes, time spent watching TV is a variable. We've stored the information we collected from a sample of Australian adults in an SPSS data file called whatanalysis.sav. When you open the whatanalysis.sav data file in SPSS, in the data view you'll see a spreadsheet with some headings and a whole heap of numbers. So in this spreadsheet each row represents a different person, so all of the responses for that person. And the columns represent the different variables. So having a look across here we can see some of the col column headings are obvious, so sex represents whether the person was male or female, age tells you how old they were. But some of them are a bit less obvious. So what does HRSTV mean? If you use the mouse to hover the cursor over that heading, you'll see a little drop-down menu that tells you it represents hours spent watching TV each day. Have a look at the first row of the data here. So this first person, we've given them an identification number of one. They're 20 years old and they watch two and a half hours of television a day. But what does the zero for sex mean? Or the five for marital status? Now in SPSS, instead of using letters to represent categories, we tend to use numbers. So instead of saying M for male and F for female, we'll use zeros and ones. And we need to know which way we've coded that variable. Are the zeros males or are they females? To find out how the variable is coded, we can click on the variable icon in the icon bar and then click on the variable we're interested, in this case sex, and we can see that sex has been coded 0 for female and 1 for male. So that means that the first person in our data file who had a code of 0 for sex was actually a female. And we can do the same thing for their marital status. If we look at marital status, they had a code of 5 and that tells us that this particular person was never married. So we might like to look to see how each of these variables is distributed. So if you have a look at the frequency table for sex that has been produced by SPSS, you'll see that altogether there were 444 people in our sample, and of those 444, 246 were female. 
So we could work out what percentage were female by taking 246, dividing it by 444, and multiplying by 100. And that would tell us that 55.4% of the people in the study were female. So that's a reasonably even split of males and females. We could also get SPSS to produce a graph of this distribution. So here we've produced a pie chart, and you can see on the pie chart that the percentage of females is slightly greater than the percentage of males. So graphs are a really useful way of presenting data. They let you and your audience see at a glance exactly what the distribution looks like. Now let's have a look at marital status. So again, there were 444 people in the sample of data that we collected, but this time not everyone answered the question. There were 28 people whose responses were missing, who didn't tell us what their marital status was. So in fact, we only know the marital status for 416 people. Of those 416, 281 said they were married. So that's a percentage of 67.5%. Of the people who answered the question, 67.5% were married. Now it's always the valid percent that we're interested in when we're reporting percentages. We could again look at a chart. Here, this is the pie chart for marital status. Because there are five different categories in marital status instead of just two, the pie chart becomes less useful. The more categories there are, the harder it is to actually visualize the distribution by looking at the pie chart. So instead of using a pie chart, we might produce instead something called a percentage bar chart. So here you can see really clearly that the most common category was married, that over 60% of people said that they were married. And then there were a fair percentage of people who were never married and small percentages in the other categories. In SPSS you can play around with charts and change the colors and the patterns. You can add shadows or three-dimensional effects and there are some instructions on how to do some of these things in Appendix A2 in the text. Now while that might be fun to play around with, when you're actually preparing graphs for a report, it's best to keep them as simple as possible. So changing the colors or adding patterns might make it easier for someone to read the graph, especially if you're going to print it in black and white. But three-dimensional graphs, while they might look attractive, tend to be misinterpreted by people. So subconsciously, if you were to give a three-dimensional bar chart, the brain tends to compare the volumes in the bars instead of the heights and it gives a false impression of the distribution. So it's best to keep it simple and to just use two-dimensional graphs. So we've looked at the distribution of sex and marital status in our sample. What about the distribution of something like time spent watching TV? Here we'll use a different procedure called the explore procedure. The explore procedure gives us a table of descriptive statistics and I've highlighted in yellow the ones that we're most interested in here. So most people are familiar with the mean. It's, it's what is typically referred to as the average. You just add up all of the values and divide by how many people there were. And the average amount of time spent watching TV here was 4.037. There's another statistic that measures what's typical or it's another measure of what's the average and that's called the median. So the median is the midpoint. So in this sample, 50% of the people watched four hours of television or less per day, and 50% watched four hours of television or more. It's the midpoint of the distribution. We then have some uh, measures of how spread out the distribution is. And the measure that we use most often here is the standard deviation. So the standard deviation of 1.5 gives us an idea of how spread the distribution was. Now for an individual distribution, the standard deviation is not all that easy to interpret. But what you need to know is that if you were comparing two different distributions, then the higher the standard deviation, the more spread out the distribution is. So the distribution with the higher standard deviation is the more spread or the more variable distribution. We also have here the minimum and the maximum. So the minimum number, the, the lowest figure we got in our sample, were people who watched no television at all per day. And the highest we got were people who watched eight and a half hours of television per day. We can also represent that distribution as a histogram. And the histogram gives us a really good visual impression of how the variable was distributed. Now the histogram looks a little bit like a bar chart, but there are some really important differences. With a bar chart, each bar represents a category, 
and each bar has a label. So if no one in the sample of marital status was widowed, then widowed wouldn't appear anywhere on the bar chart. With the histogram that we've got here for time spent watching TV, the time is grouped into equal width groups. And rather than labelling each column, we've got a scale along the horizontal axis going from 0 up to 9. We can see that all of the values here fall between 0 and 9, and that typically people watch around about 4 hours of television. So this distribution is approximately symmetric. Let's have a look at a few other shapes. So here, the distribution of anxiety before the exam, that's what we would, would refer to as a bimodal distribution. It's got two peaks, so two quite distinct groups of values. The distribution of house prices shown on the left here is positively skewed. The tail's been drawn out to the right, so it's skewed to the right or positively skewed. Whereas the distribution of enthusiasm for statistics, that's a negatively skewed distribution. The tail has been dragged out here to the left. Another set of statistics that the Explore procedure gives us are the percentiles. To interpret these, let's have a look, for example, at the 25th percentile. 25% of people watch 3 hours of television per day or less. And that means, of course, that 75% watch 3 hours a day or more. The 10th percentile, 10% 10 of people watched 2 hours of television or less. So that means 90% watched 2 hours of television or more. So the 50th percentile, 50% 50 of people watched 4 hours of television or less. That's just another word or another phrase used for the median. The 25th percentile is also referred to as the first quartile and the 75th percentile is referred to as the third quartile. So those three percentiles, the first quartile, the median and the third quartile, give us a really good summary of the distribution. You'll notice that there are two parts to the percentiles table here. The one called Tukey's hinges we usually don't use. So we can produce a, a graph that summarizes these kinds of distributions and it's called a box plot. So the box plot shows the minimum value, the first quartile, the median, the third quartile and the maximum value. But in SPSS it also shows values that are uh, more extreme. So it, it puts in things that it refers to as outliers and extreme values. So the maximum value for time spent watching television was 8.5 hours per day and that was just one person in row 117 of the data file. So SPSS shows values that are more than one and a half box widths above or below the box separately on the box plot. And it refers to these as outliers. But that can be a bit misleading. An outlier is actually something that's well separated from all of the other values, either much higher than all of the other values or much lower than all of the other values. So when SPSS refers to something as an outlier with this little um, circle symbol, it's not necessarily an outlier. SPSS also shows values that are more than three box widths above or below the box as an asterisk and calls them extreme values. So let's have a look at a couple of examples here. Here we have the distribution of enthusiasm for statistics. So on the right hand side here we have the histogram and you can see that it's this negatively skewed distribution with quite a long tail out to the left. The box plot for that same distribution you can see the negative skew everything's scrunched up to the right here so the, the median is closer to the right hand end of the box and then it's negatively skewed because the tail end has been dragged out to the left. And all of these values that SPSS refers to as outliers, they're not really outliers at all. They're not well separated from all the other values. They're just part of this long drawn out tail in the distribution. So here there are no outliers for this distribution. But if we look at the distribution of house prices, here's the histogram here, we can see that there are a couple of houses that cost a lot more than all of the others. And if you look at the box plot, you can see that positive skew again. This case here, case number 295 in the data set, that's not an outlier. It's just part of the tail end of the positively skewed distribution. But these two cases over here that are well separated, much higher than all of the other cases, they're outliers. The case in row number 81 of the data file and the case in row number 45 of the data file, they're outliers and they have values that are unusually high. 
these houses had unusually high prices, over a million dollars. Box plots are really useful when you want to compare several different distributions because you can show them all on the same graph. So here we have a series of box plots showing time taken to travel, it might be to work, using several different modes of transport. So we have the first one travel by bus, travel time by car, travel time by train B or travel time by train A. So we could use this box plot to decide how we were going to travel to work. And you can see that if you travel by car, typically the travel times are shorter. The median here is about 34 minutes. So car, most of the time, is going to be the best or the fastest way of getting to work. The problem with travelling by car is that the distribution of travel times is really variable, and it's also quite strongly positively skewed. So while a lot of the trips took less than 35 minutes, there were some trips that were as long as an hour or even slightly more than an hour. So if you want to reliably get to work in under an hour, maybe car is not the best way to travel. The, the most uh, consistent travel times were for travel by bus. So you'll see here it's, a, it's not very variable at all and all of the travel times were between about ooh, 42 minutes and 48 minutes roughly speaking. So that's a very consistent set of travel times. If you were to travel by bus you'd be fairly sure about how long it was going to take you each time. Whereas if you travel by train, well train B, that seems to be pretty good almost all of the time. But there was just this one occasion when it took over 50 minutes to get to work travelling by train B. Travel by train A, that looks a little bit less reliable than travel by train B. There are a f several outliers here where it took mm, 50 minutes or more to travel to work. So if I was making a choice based on this, and I was particularly concerned about knowing how long it was going to take me to get to work, I might decide to travel by train B. Almost all the time it takes less time to travel to work by train B than it does by bus, and I'm willing to take the risk that I'm I'm not going to be in one of these unusual cases where it takes a lot longer. If it was particularly important that you were always on time, then it might be better to take the bus. So looking at the box plot and the distributions in the box plot, we can make decisions based on the, the variability of the distributions and the typical values in the distributions and the outliers. This has been a Swinburne production. Thank you.